Right. So what happens when any anytime you have one of these economic shifts, right, from an agrarian economy to industrial, industrial to service, and now uh, service to experience economy, is that companies always give away the next level of value in, in order to better sell what they have today. Aloha, and welcome to another episode of the Groundsman Marketing Podcast, where I connect you to outstanding humans and sustainable ideas. Today's guest, it's a take two. It's Joe Pine. He's been on here before. He's an unbelievable internationally acclaimed author, speaker, and management advisor to Fortune 500 companies. He's the co-founder of Strategic Horizons, and he's written multiple books. And we're going to do a deep dive in one of his books that it's uh, was published 20 years ago called The Experience Economy. And it's about ex- competing uh, for customer time, attention, money. And uh, we kind of like break it apart, talk a little bit about uh, the transformation of the experience industry that's really formed after the publication of his book more than 20 years ago. So uh, without further ado, let's just paddle in. It's time to catch another incoming wave of unique insights, in-depth stories, and impactful ideas. Today, we welcome to the show the one, the only, <laughs> Joe Pine. Thank you very much, Scott. I appreciate being here. Well, thank you for coming to the second time. Everyone should know this is actually our <laughs> take two. We had an incredible recording of this exact episode dedicated to the experience economy and its anniversary. Uh, it's just, I believe, 20 years ago was yep. when you published the book. Correct? Correct. First time, yeah. Yeah. And we recorded uh, a great hour and we we're both lamenting because uh, the system that we recorded on uh, failed to record my side of the <laughs> podcast. So we were lamenting about how good of a podcast episode it was. It was one of my favorite ones. and uh, But we're going to recreate it today. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so we're going to re- restage. We're going to restage the experience of the podcast that we did. Yep, absolutely. So let's let's just kick right into a little bit of background. So with all your uh, experience in writing, what made you, like, what patterns did you see? What problems did you solve? Or what insight gave you the beginning of understanding and wanting to sort of, like, explore this experience economy? Like, if you could think way back, what started <laughs> I, this? Yeah, well, you know, it was uh, it was really a flash of insight, Scott, or at least a, a, a flash of saying. So, you know, my first book as you know, it was called Mass Customization, about efficiently serving customers uniquely. And I've been speaking and teaching on that first at IBM and then out on my own. And I was doing an executive education class, one full day class on mass customization. I said something that I often do, which is that mass customizing a good automatically turns it into a service. You know, if you if you help customers figure out what they want, right? You got that service of helping them figure it out. You um, then you define what it is, and then and only then do you make it and deliver it to them individually and and do it on demand, right? And those are all characteristics of services, not of physical goods. So I so I said that at this class, and one of the guys in the back room, he was sort of a smart aleck, you know. This is toward the end of the day. He said, "Well, you know, Joe, you you talked about service companies that mass customize. What does it turn a service into?" And I shot back that mass customization automatically turns a service into an experience. And I went, "Whoa, that sounds good." You know, hold on a sec, I got to write that down. <laughs> and uh, and I did write it down, and I did think about it. And I realized it was true that if you if you design a service that's so appropriate for a particular person, exactly the service that they need at this moment in time then you can't help but make them go wow and turn it into a memorable event, turn it into an experience. So I realized that experiences were, in fact, a distinct economic offering, as distinct from services, as services are from goods, and that would mean that we would have an economy based off of experiences, and that would be the experience economy. You know, So again, that was like early 1994. Uh, my partner, Jim Gilmore, at that time was a client of mine, and I shared it with him, and we decided to work on it and think about it, and eventually he left his company. He joined me in 1996. We wrote a few articles on it, including in the a Wall Street Journal and the Harvard Business Review, Strategy and Leadership, and then in 1999, uh, April, we did come out with the book, The Experience Economy. And that was some time ago. So it's – how many of your copies have, has that book been out? Well, it's, you know, it's sold hundreds and hundreds of thousands um, in, in like almost uh, 15 different languages. 
around the world. We don't know exactly how many because in China, you know, they don't really give you the real numbers mm -hmm. <laughs> of how many they sell. Uh, and we know that China has sold a ton, uh, you know, but in the, in the mid hundreds of thousands. Uh, and we did come out with an updated edition in 2011 that had many ideas, many new ideas, many new exemplars and new frameworks. And then here in um, in late 2019, actually as a 2020 copyright, uh, we have come out with the, it again in hardcover with a new subtitle, Competing for Customer Time, Attention, and Money. And we wrote a new preview for it that really sets up that context of what the experience economy is about today and how every company in the world does, in fact, compete against every other company in the world in the experience economy for time, attention, and money of individual customers. Did you say every company? Every company. Really? Every, well, yeah, I mean, think about it. You, you know, in the in the experience economy, right? We we the, the, these are the currencies of the experience economy, right? Time, attention, and money. This is what people are expending when they buy an experience, and time is limited. We only have twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, which we can experience things. And if somebody does create an experience, I'm spending my time with them. What am I not doing? Right? I'm not spending that time with you and and, and your company. In the same way, attention is increasingly scarce. You know, in today's media fragmented world, trying to capture somebody's attention with normal advertising just doesn't work the way it used to. But if somebody does create that experience, I'm spending time with them, and then and then they're engaging me, so I'm giving my undivided attention. Then what am I not doing? Is that I'm not giving that attention to you. And finally, money is consumable. If I have a dollar to spend and I spend it with some other company in some other geographic area in some other industry, what can I do with that dollar again? Is I can't spend it with you. It's gone. It's consumed. And so that's why we have to recognize that, that we're competing for time, attention, money. And therefore, the answer is we need to shift up what we call the progression of economic value to go beyond commodities, goods, and services to staging experiences for your customers. Are people creating experiences even though they aren't staging them? Well, yes. Like I mean, that you, experience? You, you, well, well, so we should go back Sorry, one kidding. step from that, you yeah. know, which is that um, um, experience is a very expansive word, right? There's a sense that, that at any moment that we're conscious, we're experiencing things. And you could say we're even experiencing sleep when we're unconscious. All right, but what we're talking about is experiences as a distinct economic offering. It's something that people buy from companies. And one of the things that's gone on, and it's it's basically the history of economic progress, is charging a fee for what once was free. You know, we used to be responsible for our, all of our own experiences. And now we increasingly pay other people to stage, yes, stage those experiences. But we can have also experiences. I mean, one is we can do our own experiences. You know, we can throw a birthday party for our loved ones, for example, uh, or we can pay somebody to stage that birthday party experience. There are also experiences that do happen by happenstance, that, they, the, that the company didn't necessarily intend to have an experience. They didn't do anything specifically to stage it, but just everything worked out in some way that it was just perfect. And so I go, wow, and, and remember it and turn it, turn it into a memorable event. Well, what about experiences that a company offers like Geek Squad, but the customer is not explicitly paying for that experience? Right. So what happens when any – anytime you have one of these economic shifts, right, from an agrarian economy to industrial, industrial to service, and now uh, service to experience economy, is that companies always give away the next level of value in, in order to better sell what they have today. You know, so, you know, my first employer was IBM. I worked for there for 13 years before I left and, uh, you know, created Strategic Horizons. And back in the day, we, the IBM had the phrase, IBM means service. And what that meant is that they give away services as long as you bought their hardware goods, right? That's where they made their money. And eventually, they had to separate their services from their goods. They charge, they started charging uh, separately for them, distinctly for them. And lo and behold, they discovered, guess what? Customers desire the services more than the goods, right? That's what they wanted, not the hardware. They wanted people to manage that hardware. They wanted to use that hardware to improve their business. They didn't want to have to own the hardware. And so IBM got into the, the service business. In the same way, you know, companies like the Geek Squad, or you could mention also, you know, my, one of my favorite exemplars of the experience economy, in addition to Geek Squad, which is wonderful, uh, all, you know, the, although they charge for the service and give away the experience, in the same way, uh, you can look at a Starbucks, right? Starbucks takes a, co a commodity of a coffee bean that charges, that costs maybe two or three cents per cup and turns it into a drink that's worth three, four, five dollars or more per cup. 
you know, because they create this coffee drinking place where people can can enjoy the time that they spend there. Right? That's what experiences are about. They're the time. And you design time if you want to stage and uh, an experience, but they don't charge explicitly for that, right? They charge a premium for the coffee. Well, eventually what happens, again, it'll happen with them just like it happened with IBM and countless other, other companies, is that eventually you have to align what you charge for with what your customers value. And that means charging explicitly for the experience, and that means charging for time. That's what they value. And that means charging an admission fee or a membership fee of, of some sort. And you see that already with some cafes. They're often called anti-cafes because they do charge per minute and the coffee's free, right? And you're totally flipping the model. And, and eventually Starbucks itself will have to do that or, or it'll be commoditized. Yeah, we, I think last time we talked about the idea that, you know, if you're adding experience on a commodity, you think that the commodity value itself would go up. Like with coffee going up to, you know, a buck sixty or something for a cup from what it was, um, you think that the price of coffee would also increase, but it hasn't. Well, yeah, and interestingly, um, I can still remember this. In April of this year, the Wall Street Journal had an article on coffee on commodity coffee, right? What does it cost per pound for beans? And and they made the point that coffee today in April 19, in 2019 costs less than it did in April 1999, 20 years ago. You know, 99 cents in, in April 20, uh, uh, 1999 and, and 93 cents in, in April of, of 2019. And it struck my eye because April of, 2000, of 1999 was when we actually published. It was official publication date of the experience economy. You know, so it actually costs cheaper today than when we first published the book. You know, but that's because that's what happens to commodities. They go up, they go down. And they went way, way up. It was almost $2 a pound at one point, And then it went way down and, and now it's settled in. It's, it's actually gone up above that dollar a pound mark in the, in, in the last six months. You know, and, and when you get commoditized, that's what happens as well. It's because um, you, you're subject to the vagaries of the marketplace. There is, and what happens with commodities is that, is that suppliers overproduce, right? There's been so much huge demand because of Starbucks and the coffee culture that's created here in the U.S. and elsewhere over the last 30 years, that there's much more demand, but there's many more people that have gotten into coffee production. And so when you when you overproduce, then prices go down. When you underproduce, prices go up. It's 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 like that. <laughs> Fair enough. So <clears throat> having been the person that identified and pretty much has seen this whole birth of the experience economy, as you've called it, um, I think some of the like we you alluded to at the very beginning, like the word experience has different meanings. And one area that I think when people hear, you know, experience, they go, hey, we need to give our a customer experience. And you hear customer experience yeah, offer, yeah, yeah. <laughs> customer experience like CX. I'm a customer experience uh, designer and stuff like that. And I feel like what it's done is watered down what you're describing. Could you maybe kind of talk about like the delta between that a little bit or? Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Scott. It's watered down. I could even use the word bastardized, <laughs> you know, because right. we talk about experiences as a distinct economic offering, right? That that's different than services. Now, the government statistics and most everybody lumps experiences into exper into services, but we got to separate them out and say, like, this is different, particularly when you pay an admission fee, when you pay a membership fee, when you pay for time, that's different than paying for activities. And that's what services do is you're paying for the activities that somebody accomplishes on your behalf, right? That's the definition of a service. Mm -hmm. And um, the um, um, I'm trying to remember where, where we were headed. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Well, we were just talking about the the sort of the watered down explanation of what experience is. Right, right, CX, right. right. Like, Right. So when uh, when people use the term CX, though, what they you know, what, the way that's generally defined, not by everybody, but most people, when they generally define CX or customer experience, they say that it means let's make our offerings, our interactions with customers nice and easy and convenient. And those are all well and good, but those are service characteristics. Right. They're they're they're. Um, uh, they're not about an actual, true, distinctive experience. I mean, nice is nice, but rarely does it rise to the level of memorability. And experiences need to be memorable to be a distinct economic offering. Um, when we do make things easy, what we often do is reroutinize things, and make it easy for our people to perform them, and that tends to standardize them, and that gets the way in the way of being personal. Experiences are inherently personal. Experiences actually happen inside of us. Services are outside of us. You have to reach inside of people and engage them. 
And then finally, convenience is the antithesis of what I'm talking about, because convenience is, is get in and out as quickly as possible, spend as little time with customers as possible, when what experiences are about is the time they spend with you, about designing that time that yields what we now call time well spent, right? Time well spent. That's what an experience is, that, that you offer time well spent. Services are about time well saved. Right. Again, you're doing things on my behalf. You save me the time of having to do it myself, like changing the oil in my car or cutting my hair or cleaning my clothes or or making my dinner, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, those are services. That's time well saved. Experiences are time well spent. It's almost as if they should relabel customer experience CX as being customer efficiency, because really, yeah, that's yeah, the whole point of that is to create as frictionless as possible. And right. that's what they're calling experience. Like, how do you get somebody to get to where the question they want, the product they want to buy, as quickly and effectively and and seamlessly and in, in the most you know uh, a pleasing way as possible, as opposed to slowing them down and enjoying the ride, so to speak. Right, beautifully put, Scott. It is you know the frictionless is another one of those terms that says that's a service if it's frictionless. Mm -hmm. Experiences need to have friction, in fact, because experiences Ooh. have to have drama. Right. The only way to be memorable is rise up to, you know, have rising action, rise up to, uh, to a drama, you know, even to a climax and then come back down again. Frictionless is as flat as possible. I mean, I mean, full frictionlessness, if that's a word, is completely flat. Nothing happens. That's frictionless. Right. An experience where something happens has to have drama to it. Cause that's why, that's why I get back to your, your, your question earlier. It's about staging. That's why you stage experiences. It's, it's a theater model, uh, where you are designing all of the elements together to rise up to that climax, come back down again and create that memory inside of customers. So is that a little bit like Hero's Journey when you talk about storytelling where you have like once sure. upon a time and then everything was great until and there's a challenge, they overcome it, solution, and there's an outcome? Like that's – that's the typical yep. arc of a, a storytelling. Yes. Now, now that and that's that's one type of drama. Not all dramas are hero's journey, but it's a it's obviously a wonderful one. It has beautiful archetypes. If you actually look at a hero's journey, what you actually see is multiple dramatic structures, right? That come up to a climax and come back down again many times, and uh, <laughs> and so you've got this really accumulation of of individual dramas. This is why you often have you know like like you know, nine Star Wars movies and, and uh, you know, three different Lord of the Rings movies and three more Hobbits movies and so forth, because you've got those journeys that go up and down and up and down that you can have a distinct drama around them. But you can also think about drama as, you know, a story structure of the beginning, a middle and an end. You can think about it as a Disney terms. It's a pre-show, a show and a post-show. You can even think about it as just one stage drama, which is a signature moment. You know, what's your signature moment? The Geek Squad, for example, again, signature moment, pulling out that badge when you when you arrive at a customer's office or at their um, a home and you pull out the badge, say, hi, I'm from the Geek Squad. Slowly step away from that computer, ma'am. Right. That's how you turn it into a, a you know, a service into an experience, even if, again, they don't charge explicitly for it. But does, it, does that experience, like, well, that sounds great, right? Like, and it sounds a little bit on the Disneyland entertainment side. But what about experiences that are meaningful, transformational, but they aren't so theatrical? Um, is there a way to make it feel like like they're impactful, but you create an experience, but maybe they don't even realize it? Like, they don't feel like they're part of some sort of, like, you know, like, theater experience. It's more <laughs> well, subtle than that. Well, it's it's theater can very much be subtle. It's theatrical that can't, <laughs> right? right? There's a boundary you go over when you use, when you become theatrical and use theatricality, as opposed to using theater principles, which is simply designing all of the elements that come together, right? The the, the physical environment, the words that people say, how they go about uh, saying those, and and so forth. So, so yeah, you could have many experiences that are not theatrical at all. I mean, I, I think there is a level of theatricality, for example, when you order a drink and they, they ask you your name and they pass it to somebody else and they make the drink and they shout out the order and so forth. But the primary part of the experience is not entertainment. It's the aesthetic value of being in the place and spending your time there, whether you want to socialize, whether you want to read, whether you want to do a little work, you know, whatever it might be. 
right? Getting a respite from your day, right? That's that's an aesthetic experience. In fact, we the the even before we get into theater in the book, we talk about the four E's of experience, four realms of experience, where there's entertainment, yes, there's aesthetic, yes, but there's also educational experiences that are about learning, there's and there's escapist experiences. And it's the, you know, entertainment gets a lot of the notion. Escapist is about tourism. You go to, a, you watch a Disney movie, it's entertainment. You go to a Disney theme park, it's actually an escapist experience. But there are many other ways of doing it. And, and in fact, what we, what we talk about in the book is that the best way, the most robust way of, uh, way of staging experience is when you hit the sweet spot in the middle, when you have aspects of all, you know, four realms of those experiences. I wonder if there's some science to support that we learn better, we ex- we <clears throat> engage yep. better at a higher level when, because I know that happens when there's when we learn with fun. So I know that our bar, our brain re- uh, receives more information and we're more susceptible to learning and memory. I'm wondering if this is the same thing in some way. Well, yeah, because you know the the, and the word that's been coined for what you just described is edutainment, right? Right, that edutainment because what ed, what entertainment does is it holds your attention, and when you want people to learn, guess what? In order for them to learn, they need to have their attention held, but they also need to be active in that. And that's a difference, you know, key difference between ed, ed, entertainment and educational, is that you are you are um, actively involved. You're wrestling with the ideas. You're thinking about them. You're doing homework. You're applying them, and so forth. And uh, and so you know, one of the things we added when we updated the experience economy to that 4E model that I mentioned is we added the, the, all of the pairwise comp, uh, uh, combinations, you know, like edutainment mm-hmm. and the, these don't all, you know, fall trippingly off the tongue or anything, but, uh, but I've become, you know, just this year I've becoming increasingly enamored with them. There's just a lot of value in thinking about this, that short of thinking about all four at once, if you think of two at once, you know, you can really make a lot of difference. So you think about edutainment again, education plus atta- entertainment, but then think about edu stat or excuse me edu uh, escapist, right? Edu escapist is when you are combining uh, educational and escapism, and what that is is a field trip, mm-hmm. right? You go you you learn by going someplace else, <laughs> right? And learning what they have, to, and you know, and businesses do that. As employees, we do that, right? We, you know, I take companies on experience expeditions all the time to be able to go uh, visit a place and see how they're doing their experiences so you can learn from it, right? That's an educapist experience. You know, then there is, uh, um, there's escasthetic, right? Escasthetic, where, where you're doing escapist plus aesthetic. And that is basically what virtual reality is because you're totally immersing people in a different environment or even a, a, even think of even a deprivation tank and things like that. It's where you're really controlling all of the senses. And how do you, how do you do that? You know, then there is um, uh, escatainment where you combine ex, um, uh, uh, escapist and entertainment. And that's what attractions are. I did a talk in London a, a couple of weeks ago uh, to the attractions industry, you know, the, the usually short of Disney, but up to and including theme parks. And they combine that entertainment and, and escapist. There's also esk-aesthetic where you combine – well, no, sorry, that one I mentioned. Uh, there's anesthetic where you combine entertainment and, uh, and aesthetic, and those are you know, just like you know, very passive experiences um, where you know, – like, like you know, maybe being in a, in, a, in a national park or someplace else where you know, you're just – you're just, it, it's just letting everything wash over you, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, and then they just, I don't know if this is that interesting to your audience, but there uh, then you, you you also have um, uh, uh, um, uh, escatain or, or excuse me, um, I'm trying to think of the right one, uh, edustetic, right? And that's what museums are and art galleries, right? That you education plus aesthetic, you be there with the art, but you're learning about it as well. And so I do think there's a lot of value in in, in thinking about those things. So if I'm a business owner, I have. Uh- Ned's muffler shop or I'm a B2B company, plumbing, wholesale or something. And I'm listening to this and going, how does this even apply to me? Because you're saying all businesses should be doing this or, or are doing this. Well, how do they how do they kind of apply this? Right. So, well, let's get back to to theater again. Okay. Because I'm often asked about small companies and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and one of the things I often say, well, you know, big companies start as small companies. Starbucks right. started as a manufacturer of coffee with no experience whatsoever. They didn't even make the coffee for you. And they turned that into a you know, huge enterprise with over 20,000 outlets now. 
But any company can embrace theater because it doesn't require any capital equipment. It requires basically understanding that when you stage an experience, work is theater. And it's not a metaphor. It's not work as theater. It literally means work is theater. Whenever you or your workers are in front of customers, you're on stage. And you need to to um, act in a way that engages the audience. And the key distinction here, I talk about the distinction of services and experiences between time well saved and time well spent. The key distinction here regarding theater is, is uh, what versus how. That services are about the what, that you have to accomplish the, the what, the functional thing. So if you're an auto body shop, right, you have to be able to uh, receive the car. You have to be able to do the, the contract. You have to be able to fix the car and clean the car and return it and, and, and so forth. But how you go about doing that is what turns any mundane interaction into an engaging encounter. That's, again, where the Geek Squad majors. It's in how they go about repairing your computers, which every other competitor has to do, installing your software, connecting your hardware, so forth. That's the what. But how you go about doing it uh, can turn it into a, a great experience. I always thought, like, if a gas station or a, a mechanic shop, they um, just invested a whole ton of money in their bathroom and make it into, like, the, the Taj Mahal of bathrooms, that they would just crush yeah. it. <laughs> Seriously, just that. Just do that. Don't worry about anything else. Like, leave the grease pit. Yeah. Just do that. <laughs> right. Or, you know, I, I think that's a great idea. And, and or you could just, just do the waiting room, right? If you're, if you're, if where people are, dro- you're dropping off your car and you got a waiting room, well, that's where the major, because that's where they're actually spending time with you. And they don't necessarily want to be spending that time, right? They don't want to have to have their car be repaired or fixed or whatever. But if they're sitting there, well, man, make it a great experience for them. Yeah, what like what about um, electronic? Like you think of Uber is me getting uh, notified that my driver's coming and he's got a five star rating and I can track him and I don't know maybe it pops up his favorite game is you know Lord of the Rings or something. Um, <laughs> is that is that part of an experience as well? Like the does it have to be human to human? Well, it, well, no, it doesn't have to be human to human. You can certainly have an experience. I mean, think about all the apps on your phone. Mm-hmm. Or you want to get a little respite and you go and play, you know, Candy Crush or Fortnite or some other game on your phone, uh, Solitaire or whatever. Or you want to get a personal connection. You know, I think the, you know, I do believe that, you know, even a phone call, even a text conversation um, can create a personal connection with a loved one that rises to the level of an experience. I won't get into the details here, you know, but my my wife and I years ago fell in love with each other over the phone when she moved away <laughs> and we started talking for an hour every day, right? Mm-hmm. That's that could, same thing can happen uh, virtually in any way. I uh, wrote a book, Infinite Possibility, on that. Uh, so, yeah, you can do all of this um, uh, electronically. It, you know, the, the, the real world will still provide the most robust of experiences, um, but there's a lot that you could do. So when you're talking about staging the experience with employees and, you know, and customer interactions, uh, if you recall from our last uh, take one of this discussion, what <laughs> came up for you in our discussion, which I thought was really interesting, was authenticity. Like, is that are you being unauthentic by staging and kind of like <laughs> having that interaction? Well, you know, a lot of people, and my wife's one of them, believe that – uh, you know, theater is just in its very nature inauthentic, that it's phony, that you're pretending to be somebody else. Mm-hmm. But that's not the case. That's just a particular kind of theater. And, you know, we, you, Jim and I wrote a book on authenticity to follow up the experience economy because people always bring it up, right? They bring it up when you talk about theater and about experience staging and so forth. And, um, and basically, um, you know, the, the, it, when it comes time to, to acting, as you think about it, that acting is fundamentally about making choices. You look up definition of acting, you talk to acting instructors, read acting books, and they'll always talk about it's your intention. What do you intend to do? It's your choices you're making. And we all know that we act differently for, for different audiences. We act differently in front of our parents than we do our kids, in front of friends than we do our colleagues, in front of strangers um, than we do acquaintances. It doesn't mean that we're being fake or phony in any one of them. Obviously, people can be, right? Absolutely. There are many fake people or people that are fake in many of their interactions, and that can happen in business as well. But it doesn't mean that that has to be so. It simply means that you choose what parts of yourself to reveal in front of, of people. 
You know, my favorite example there, another small company again, and, and you probably know of it, is Pike Place Fish Market in Seattle. Oh, right. We talked about it last time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. What, what, what wonderful theater. I mean, if you, and if you've never heard of them, you know, go look it up. Right? See the videos out there on YouTube. They just know theater better than anybody else. But including their signature moment that, as I mentioned earlier, their signature moment is when you order a fish, your worker shouts it out, all the workers shout it back, and then they throw that fish 15, 20 feet across the counter where somebody catches it and then wraps it up for you. Uh, and But these people go home smelling like fish, right? They're fish mongers. It is very real to them. They just know that if they, if they make you have fun, it gets back to your point about entertaining while educating. If they entertain you while you're there, the chances that they sell fish go up and they can actually go home sooner when they when they sell their entire catch of the day. <laughs> so if you're looking to design one and you want to engage your employees, you can see how getting employee engagement, multi-stakeholders involved yep. Yep. and bought in. What's the strategy for doing that Like as you've designed one? Well, it, it, you know, all of the principles and frameworks we, we talk about and write about and work with companies on do apply to employees. And you knew, do need, as you say, to create a great employee experience to give them the wherewithal to create a great uh, experience for your customers, particularly with theater. You know, And you do need to direct them to act. You need to give them rehearsal time. You need, need to think about that. And we've never really written on that, but actually uh, earlier this year, we came out with a, with a new offering called On Stage. And it's a frontline video training program. It takes all of our ideas, particularly around theater, but also around you know, mass customization and surprising customers and so forth, and brings it down to where anybody can understand it and anybody can apply it, you know, where, where people go through exercises, we guide them through this video training where they can um, um, discover new ideas on, on how they could better stage the experience for their, for their customers, where they can share them with each other, determine what are the best things, try them out, and then apply them. And again, any business can enhance their uh, offering, their interactions with customers simply by embracing theater. And this is a, this is a great way to do it. So it's like at a high level, is it pretty much like take a map of every customer journey and interaction and then looking for those moments and trying to choreograph different things that make sense within your brand that can, um, you know, either bring someone on a, on a literal journey and to an outcome that creates this experience? Is that kind of how you sort of like at a high level sort of think about how you would create it? Yeah, we, you know, we think of it a little <laughs> differently. Um, but, yeah. but, but the way most people think about it, that's not a bad description. Let me put it that way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I was just trying you to know, get my head around Instead of customer like, journey, I'd rather use dramatic structure. Dramatic right? structure. Okay. Right. That it really is about the drama that you create and take them on. And it's really about designing time. And you've got to do things like understand what your theme is, what your organizing principle is. To your point earlier, it doesn't mean it's like Disney. It doesn't mean it's a, it's a fantasy theme or it's not – doesn't have to be like a theme restaurant that's that's over the top and in your face. Uh, it simply has to be the organizing principle for the experience. And when you when you write that down, when you say this is it, then a whole lot of good things flow from that and allow you to create a uh, a cohesive experience, right? So that's got to be part of your design, as well as hitting the sweet spot, as well as the the drama, as well as making it a personal experience by using customization to turn your goods and services and shift them up to to create a great experience. And well, well, I'll mention one more, Scott. You mentioned yeah. earlier in passing, you said even transformative, right? And that's exactly right. right. Even You can even create transformative experiences where you're helping people achieve their aspirations. Where you're, you know, If you're a fitness center, for example, people are hiring you because they got a particular fitness aspiration, whether it's to uh, go from flabby to fit, whether it's to lose 20 pounds or to gain washboard abs, get into the, the bikini you wore last summer, whatever it might be. And you're hiring this company to help you achieve that. And you, you only ever change through the experiences you have. And if you design them properly, then you can make them life transforming. Well, I mean, the explosion of coaches um, yeah. and uh, just this whole transformational, I guess, almost like transformational economy where it's about helping people get further faster. Um, I, I see this as being something that people should be paying attention to because it's kind of applicable. 
Yeah, absolutely. It, it, you know, we actually we actually identify transformations in chapter nine of the book as the next level of economic value beyond experiences. The transformations are a distinct economic offering. We use experiences as the raw material to guide people to change. You know, fitness centers, healthcare, a lot of education, even a lot of financial services is about uh, aspirations. You know that, that that money is the means to the end, not the to- not the actual end, and. Um, And so, as you mentioned, coaches, right? Coaches of all stripes, whether they're sports coaches or executive coaches or life coaches or fitness coaches, whatever, they're in the transformation business. And if you realize that, then again, a lot of good things are going to happen to allow you to create more economic value for your customers. So it's like if I went to my accountant, um, on one hand, you know, if you're just the experience and suddenly my accounting experience is like medieval times, but if it goes <laughs> to the next level, he's made me a millionaire. You know, he's used my right, wealth right. management, you know, he's transformed the wealth and he's done what we've uh, collectively hoped that we'd want to do. Right, exactly. That's what the, that's what you're hiring the accountant for, right? Not just for the services, but for your aspiration. And if they recognize that, then they'll be able to do things that will make it much more likely to for you to achieve your aspiration. So in your original book, you had lots of examples, but now, I mean, it's been 20 plus years. There yeah. must be just like a floodgate of examples. Like, yeah. and I know you and I were talking on LinkedIn. There was a couple I went, oh my gosh, this is another awesome one. Um, like what, what, tell me about the experience and maybe some examples so people can start biting their teeth and some like examples that, that you would just wouldn't even think of, but yet you're like, wow, that's a really smart way of, of delivering an experience in an everyday bit type of business that people can relate sure. to. Well, you know, so I'll, uh, we have updated it, you know, since we first published with a lot of the examples and so forth. But like you said, there's an explosion. You can't keep up with it all. I'm constantly learning every day about new examples. And, you know, today it was somebody sent me an email about a craft brewery in New York that created like four or five rooms that they list on Airbnb where you're like staying in the brewery. <laughs> oh, no way. You know? Yeah, exactly. So you see that sort of stuff. You know, I think that, you know, one of the, the, the best retail formats I've seen come out is Italy. Are you familiar with them? No. Italy is everything Italian cooking. You know, it's just such a great ne- name, right? E A T A L Y, right? Italy, and it's what's interesting is that it's you know it's what's what's now called a food hall, but it's the best food hall I've seen, and it's from one company as opposed to many companies, and they have all five economic offerings, right? You can buy the commodities, you can buy the ingredients that go into Italian meal, you can buy the goods, the 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 um, you know, the physical things made out of those agreements, like uh, 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 ingredients, like pasta and so forth, or the appliances that you would use, the the, the cutlery and the and, and uh, bowls and pots and pans, et cetera, that you could use to make Italian cooking. You can buy services and experiences in the cafes and restaurants that they have there where they actually make you food uh, in the place, uh, all Italian, of course. And then you can even have a turn me into a chef a transformation at the Italian cooking school. That you pay admission for uh, inside of the place, and it's just an all, and it's just the way it all comes together. I think is just amazing, right? So just a great, great uh, experience. The you know, in terms of a small company, one of my favorite examples, and this is in the new book, is uh, a gentleman who's become a friend of mine since I found out about him. Ami Arad in San Francisco had a men's store called Wingtip. And uh, he was looking at, you know, had a small men's store. He wanted to sort of make a bigger one and, and go up in scale. And he was reading a bunch of books. And, and one of them was the experience economy. And he read the part where we say, what would you do differently if you charged admission? Right. Again, what we talked about earlier about aligning what you charge for with what your customers value. And he sort of said, well, that's crazy. I can't charge admission to a men's store. And he thought about it and sort of stuck in his craw. And he kept thinking, well, how could I do that? And finally, he hit upon an idea. And it's by creating a wingtip club, right? A membership feed club. And he prototyped this as an original store. Get this. He basically took a conference room. I mean, he said it was like 12 feet by six feet or something. Put a table in there, a couple of chairs, some drinks in that. And he offered people to, to join the wingtip club. And they did it. And they loved it. It was just this little respite from the day. They got to hang out. If they, you know, It's a very particular men's store. The, the theme is solutions for the modern gentleman. And if you identify with that, if you're a modern gentleman, then you love hanging out in the place. So then he got uh, he got financing and he bought or he leased 
um, uh, four floors in the old Bank of Italy building across from the Transamerica building in San Francisco. And the first floor and the ground floor where they have the original vault of the bank uh, is the men, is the wingtip men's store, right? The wingtip store. And the top two floors are the wingtip club. And he, he, it's for men and women, and he charges a membership fee. He actually, the, they have different levels of membership, but the highest level is a $3,000 initiation fee and $200 per month. And he's got hundreds, maybe a thousand or more members of this with a full service restaurant and bar, you know, billiards, uh, cigar lounge outside and, and uh, all these different events from wine sabering to, J- to Ian Fleming's birthday with James Bond Day and the Kentucky Derby and all this. And I've been there and it's just a, it's just a wonderful, wonderful experience. And this is a men's store with one small location. <laughs> so he's almost like completely – that's really interesting. He's completely almost gotten into another business. Would yeah, be the, yeah. So someone's yeah, listening and, and going, arguably, I'm in arguably, business with X. He, I do not want to be in the business of YZ. How can right. they make an experience that doesn't – so that they don't feel like they're in another business, but they're adding value to their customer experience, creating uh, uh, a transformation or, or a next-level experience? Well, you know, and, you know, and it arguably is the Wingtip Club is probably more profitable than the Wingtip store today, but they do, they do you know, benefit each other. But, you know, it's, it's, it's basically, if, you know, the, the thing I always ask is what business are you really in, right? What business are you really in, right? Determine that, 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 that you may think you're in the services business, but in fact, that people may be buying from you is an experience because you do it so well. So if you just simply recognize that, hey, we're in the experience business, we still have to do all those activities. We still have to do all the what's, but we're in the experience business. Let's major on, on the how's. Um, and, and, and so forth, including, including with, with transformations. When you're working with CEOs, do you find sometimes that they think they're in the, we'll use plumbing is they think they're in the plumbing business, but they don't realize they're in the customer business. Like it's whatever the customer wants. If they actually think differently about what they're in the business for and plumbing, it just might be what they started with. And, you know, I find this often when I'm consulting the businesses they are so fixated maybe on the, the sort of category and they feel like it's a box when they really should really break that box and think differently about how can they service the customer, the, the, and the type of customers that they ideally would love to service and just give them more value and expand their business more profitable. If you think in those terms, in my exactly. mind, I don't know what your experience has been. Yeah, no, exactly. I think, you know, the way I like to think about it is, is means and ends again. It's about means and ends. Whatever you're selling today is the means to an end, right? Customers aren't buying what you think you're selling. They're buying something else. And if you figure out what the end is rather than the means, then you gain more economic value. And then think about, okay, now that you provide that end or could provide that end, what what is that the means to? And work your way up until you find the final end, the final aspiration that people are really deep down searching for, whether they're consumers or whether they're inside of businesses, and then figure out how you can provide that. Right, because they're they're buying the product because they want to accomplish something. What they're trying to accomplish is usually, if you follow it all the way through, it's right. usually a feeling. I mean, right. sure, they're, I think uh, Seth Godin describes it, you know, they're buying the, the shelf, but they're buying the shelf because they want to hang the pictures, the pictures of their family because they want to feel connected to their family at every moment they're in the room or something. Right, so it's right. like, you know, maybe thinking a little in more in depth about what they're doing with your product or the service or what they're trying to feel and experience. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. And in, in Clayton Christensen terms and others, it's the job to be done. Right. What's the job to be done that they're that they're hiring you? It goes back to this famous 1970s, I think, Harvard Business Review article by Ted Levitt, uh, where he said basically that people don't want to drill. They want holes. Right. So the drill is the product. But what they want is the service of a hole. And if you make the holes, then you can gain more value than just selling the drills and so forth. Mm-hmm. And then why do they want the hole? Well, they want the hole because they want it, like you said, hang a picture. And then why they want to hang a picture? Well, they want to hang a picture because they want to remember, um, you know, their loved ones. And why do they want to remember loved ones? Because they want a better relationship with their with their spouse. Well, how can I help them have a better relationship with their spouse? Now, I'm not saying a drill maker can do that, but there are many companies that, that, that can, that you figure out where is sort of the limit of where you can go up that chain uh, to provide more value for your customers. 
Well, I suppose just even following that thinking as an exercise within a business leads you to some different places. You may think beyond the feature benefits that are so present, and then maybe that unearths some different ways that you can uh, create these experiences because that's part of what you're you're uncovering, if you will. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, that's exactly right. So what's your one thing that you're surprised about in this experience economy journey over 25 years? <laughs> oh, the one thing I'm surprised about, you know, it's... Something you just never expect. You're like, I never even thought this would... Like, it just it just came out of nowhere. You're like, like I, I never would have thought that. Or or did you already figure it out? Like, you're like, yeah, I had the holy <laughs> land. Like, Well, you know, I, I for the most part, we did figure it out. Because, you know, we even asked what's next after experiences and realized it was transformation. So we're not mm-hmm. surprised about the increasing use of the term transformation economy, the increasing companies that are paying, for, they're charging for outcomes, which is what you have to charge for with an experience versus time for a, a an experience and activities for a service and things for goods and stuff for commodities, right? Mm-hmm. There, that's already happening. So we did uh, foresee that. One of the things that I'm, I'm also not surprised by that we got the biggest pushback when we first published the book is on, is, is on that charging emission, that now there's just scores and hundreds of companies that, that charge emission. Um, one I'm, I'm pleased at that's sort of come about in the last year is um, is particularly around um, over tourism uh, and places like Venice now is basically they're calling it different different but basically they're charging the mission to go into Venice city center because there's too many freaking people there <laughs> mm-hmm. and and it ruins the experience for everybody and helps it doesn't help the residents and so we're going to charge for them to give us the wherewithal to do things in the city. And then when we have dynamic pricing, so when it's really full, we'll charge even more. We're, never, we're not going to kick anybody out, but we're going to charge you a heck of a lot to be able to get in there. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing. And there are more and more tourism companies that do that. One thing I have been surprised on the last couple of years is, is also the, the, the in tourism, there's um, a new movement towards tra- what's called transform- transformational travel. There's even a transformational travel council. Um, that is out there helping companies get into this business. And I didn't foresee it in, tour- in tourism. You know, it, it, we're tra- you, know, you think about fitness centers and, and healthcare mm-hmm. and, and con- management consulting is about transformations. But that's what I didn't, I didn't foresee is, is, is really seeing transformations take hold in, in travel. And the basic reason being is that when we get outside of the norms, when we get outside of our daily routine is when we're most open to change. And, and hospitality companies recognize that. So what would be some examples of uh, transformational travel? Um, well, there are spas, for example, that that really focus on wellness. It's not just about, okay, you come here and we'll give you a spa, you know, today and, and two days from now and, and the day before you leave. It's like, what's the entire sequence of things that we want to do um, mm-hmm. during, the, um, during your week-long stay here? that will really give you a different mindset and then in particular that you can take back with you. Because if you don't take things back with you, then you weren't really transformed. There's others, the Transformation Travel Council works with, with companies that, uh, that go out on more uh, explorations that will go into a, you know, into the rainforest or go into the desert. And Are you and, talking about like ayahuasca trips or something? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that is, but. Oh, it's like me- like plant medicine. It's like oh, okay. Is that a yeah. yeah? Is that a smoking things in the? <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. I, I haven't done it, but it's like uh, it's supposed to give you a transformational experience. It's like ancient right. plant medicine. Okay, yeah. Is that a Canadian thing? No, no. I think it's South America. Oh, okay. I think that's where it's where it's. So I mean, from. yeah, not that it couldn't include that, but it's yeah. it's it's ways of getting you to sort of rethink, you know. So in addition to traveling, it's like, okay, what do we think about? How do I how do I think about my life in a different way? Is this what I want to be doing, and so forth? And um, and that allows you to create that transformation. Sometimes it's as simple as I just want a better relationship with my spouse or with my kids. You know, think about going to a, a Disney park for a week, or you know, and, and so forth, and. And saying that here's what I want is I want my kids to come out of this week thinking I'm a hero, right? How do you do? Well, there are ways that they could specifically do that where you, the hero's journey, right? Is mm-hmm. the, is the dad of the, of the family saving the day, saving the week, you know, and how do you make that happen? That's eminently doable. Yeah. You can see how people would um, pay to like, I, I feels like there's this shift in tourism where there people are becoming a little bit, um, 
less inclined to just show up and lie on a beach. They want more. Right. Right. And especially with this new millennials, like they really do want an experience. Like that must be something that has either, I don't know if you anticipated it or if it's just like as the rise of experiences, it's shifted. Because they say now that millennials, they'd rather have an experience than own own actual product or or property. Right. Um, and that's like, that's this up and coming age. It's, it's, I just see the only exploding. Like we've already seen the beginning of it, it feels like. Or, or right. what's your sense of this? No, that's exactly right. We, we've we made huge progress in 20 years. I, I, I used to just talk about the nascent, the emerging, the forthcoming experience economy. Now we talk about it as it is here, but it is only going to get bigger, right? As you say, with younger generations, the, the, you know, all generations prefer experiences over things. All generations will be happier if they buy experiences over things and so forth. But the thing with millennials is the first generation to really grow up in the experience economy where life was a paid for experience, where, where their parents did uh, hire somebody to stage the birthday party experience most of the years of their life versus doing it at home with, you know, with pin, pin the tail on the donkey uh, mm-hmm. games like, like, uh, like I grew up with. And so they, uh, they really being born in the experience economy, they do treat things differently and are more on that, that end of the scale of preferring it over things. Is there going to be an issue where it's like we have like, so we have attention deficit? We have uh, yeah, people yeah. who can't pay attention to anything, so we're constantly entertaining, creating experiences to keep people engaged. Is there some sort of like other aspect of of creating experience where it's like more zen like, where you're not actually creating any experience? Like it's totally <laughs> like simple as simple and clean as can be, like going for a walk in the park. Like, well, that's that sensory deprivation experience. <laughs> that's a good point. I actually right. done it. I actually do like the sensory yep. deprivation tanks. I do it after I travel. It gets rid of my jet lag. Yep, <laughs> it's awesome. So that's interesting. So, um, so the answer is yes, and the answer is. There, you know, there's never been any change in the world that didn't have bad effects, right? That didn't, that wasn't deleterious in some ways to some people. And that's the case with the shift to experiences. And you're right about attention deficit syndrome. You're right about, you know, that, that people increasingly take their phones out and are taking pictures of experiences instead of actually experiencing it themselves, right? Sort of ruining the, the actual experience in order to try and remember it better or to, or worse, just to share it. There's, you know, people on social media that want to, that are inauthentic, that want to make a projection, a, ideal projection of themselves instead of who they really are, right? All that sort of thing is out there. Um, but then, like people you know, photoshopping their weight loss. <laughs> right, exactly. <Yeah. laughs> I didn't know that was happening, but once you say it, I am not surprised. <laughs> oh, there's apparently um, there's apparently this whole thing where people can want to just come in for the day for a gym and take pictures for their Instagram, but they're not yeah. actually working out. Like it's just all yeah. staged. It's just <laughs> seems right. such a crazy world that we live in right. when people have to project an experience yep. uh, that's not real. Right. So, you know, so that stuff happens and it's a pendulum. It'll swing back and people realize, no, that that's not the way they want to be and, and so forth. And uh, and hopefully everybody will find that happy medium where they're experiencing what makes sense for them in a way that is authentic to them. Or what we talked about last time, I just remembered right now, we came up with the idea together. Remember, we came up with the idea of yep. maybe the experience rating where it right. was like how authentic and, and transformational it was and it had like a weighting. Because as we get all these experiences, I think people are going to go, okay, I've only got so much time and I really right. want right. to go and create a transformational experience for me and my spouse. Like give me the top 20 that are in this country or something. Like like that. that's what I think maybe this is uh, – uh, heading towards no different than right now for Yelp for restaurants. Yeah, and there there are actual experience platforms out there that increasingly do that. You know, the the um, Airbnb went from being just a place to stay platform to an experience platform to a trips and adventures platform. So, uh, and there are many other companies that are in that business. So, so the the logical conclusion I think there. In fact, I wrote about this like 15 years ago, and nobody's really done it yet is to manage all of my experiences, is take control and, and tell me what are the experiences I should Ooh. be having, what you know, based on what you know about me, what my past experience are, based on where I am, like you say, when you travel, you know, I'm here in this, this city, where are the restaurants I should go to? What are the, the plays or movies or experiences that I should be having? Who's also here that I should meet? You know, that maybe is an old friend of mine or maybe it's somebody that we could be working together. 
how do you do all of that? And I think there are companies that are uniquely positioned to be able to do that. Foremost in my mind is American Express, you know, and and and, and other um, uh, financial services companies because they know all of your transactions, they know where you are, and so forth. But but it could be it could be Apple itself, it could be an Amazon, um, or uh, certainly could be a Google or Facebook that, that does that. Oh my god, that's um, a little bit creepy though, because you think I don't want to give them more information <laughs> about myself. I think of the uh, the show called The Game with um, beautiful. Yep, yeah, we talk about yeah. it in the book. Yeah, so it's like like so there you've completely customized an experience based right. on that all their personal identifiable information, history, and background, and then suddenly have this unbelievable experience that seems so real. Um, right, but it's so not. Can, what, what's but, what's not creepy is when people <laughs> take that information, they use it to benefit you. Right. Right, it's creepy when they're using information you don't know they have to target you. That's what's creepy. <laughs> yeah, or unwanted information. You yeah, know? it's like or it's unusable. But when they're thinking about when you think about what you're just saying before, like you could literally see how people would do like a transformational audit, like see where you are yeah. right now, yeah. and then they can stage a progression of experiences so that you know because you know sometimes if you go to an experience. And uh, I did this for I did this for my my then fiance my now wife was when I went to Costa Rica I purposefully staged um, the different uh, places that we we're going to go to and I saved the best for last because I knew yep. if yep. I went to the last place first it would ruin all the rest so right. I staged it right. That's exactly right? Right. but it prog- yeah. was a progression right and yep. she loved it you created so, your own dramatic structure I did right and and you're also following Dr Daniel Kahneman's uh, peak end rule. You know, where he studied experiences, and he said the two things to, to, to focus on, to put your most money on, is the peak of the experience and the end of the experience. And what you did is you collapse those into both, right? I want the peak at the very end because this is what she's going to remember. Hmm. Uh, it's, there you go. I didn't even know what I was doing. Maybe I sublimely <laughs> remembered all the information from the book and I applied it perfectly. So, yep. <laughs> okay, well, you know, is there anything else that you can think of when you're when someone that's listening to this and just goes – to help them galvanize this, if you could sort of sum it up and go, you know, in the end, the experience economy, you know, like from where we were to where we are today and looking forward, like if you're really thinking about why this is important to pay attention to and dive into your book, this is where it's going and this is where you can really see more economic profitability and so forth. Like, can you kind of wrap it up a little bit for somebody just to kind of go, this is where it's going and and why it's so important to maybe just like re-engage with this? Well, the, the, the basic thing you want to avoid as a business is being commoditized, right? Being commoditized is, means you're undifferentiated, that people don't care about your brand or your features and benefits and so forth. All they care about is price, right? That's when you're commoditized. They, want, they buy you at price, you know, like coffee beans. And so you need to constantly be looking in and searching for differentiation. And the way to differentiate today is to go beyond goods and services that are increasingly commoditized, that people want at the lowest possible price and the greatest possible convenience so they can spend their hard-earned money and their hard-earned time on the experiences that they value and even those that are, are transformative. One of the things we, we introduce in the book is, is this notion, again, of time. You're designing time. The, that, that services may be about time well saved, but experiences are about time well spent. And how do you create co- time well spent for your customers? That they value the time that they spend with you. And transformations, if you think about it, are time well invested. That they're actually investing time with you. That with compound interest, it's going to pay dividends now and into the future. And again, that's the greatest uh, level of economic value that you can provide. Love it. Well, that's how I feel about this podcast and the you know time that you've invested with me is it's been time well spent. <laughs> I really appreciate you letting us have a full focus on the experience economy and kind of do a deeper dive. I'd love to take it to the next step. And, and in the future, we just do a deep dive on authenticity since there's so much uh, discussion around the overuse of that word or... Uh, maybe the lack of authenticity in some ways. So that would be a great dive if you're up to it. Yeah, no, I'd be glad to do that. It is, It absolutely is overused. We have you know, five axioms of authenticity in, in that book. And, and one of them is if you are authentic, you don't have to say you're authentic. Oh, yeah. Like how can you be more authentic? Right. Hey, let's be more authentic. <laughs> it doesn't – you can't do it. Like you can't no. be more authentic. 
double your authentic efforts. <laughs> you know, it's like, right. By just blasting so that, the word authentic out, right? Yeah, totally. And I think it's it's I think people have lost the its true meaning of of the essence of what it is. So that would be a great episode. Anyways, <laughs> there's just be one to start recording about that episode. Um, <laughs> thank you again for being on this going, show. What's that, Joe? <laughs> I mean, we can just start. We just keep just keep going and start talking about it. But no, that's all right. <laughs> we could, yeah, if you have the time, I'll I'll keep recording. Yeah. <laughs> but um, maybe we'll just save that one for the next next edit. All right. So thanks you again for being on the show. That was awesome. Um, I really appreciate your insights. Uh, where can they follow you? Where can they get more information? And where can they uh, digitally go and type something in and get more background on this? Sure, you can you can uh, follow or connect with me on LinkedIn, of course. So just look for Joe Pine, and on Twitter, it's at Joe Pine, J O E P I N E. Our website is strategichorizons.com, Strategic Horizons with an S, and there you can learn about our ideas, our books, uh, our latest thoughts. We have a blog there called Thoughts, uh, which we post every once in a while. Uh, and we have links there also to, again, our new offering, onstagetraining.com. Uh, where you can think about how you can train your frontline staff to be able to straight, stage great experiences uh, for your guests, right? Because that's where the rubber meets the road is in that direct interaction that your people have with uh, with your customers. Brilliant. Thanks again, Joe, for joining. My pleasure, Scott. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Again, this is another episode of the Groundswell Marketing Podcast. As always, drop some love and email scott at groundswell.marketing or give some stars and some feedback and maybe some ideas for another show. So until next time, thanks, everyone. Mahalo. Mahalo.